Eternally Yours, a program of inspiring music and an eternal message of hope. On today's program, Will Flambert shares his testimony. Our musical guests are Josie Lambert and Marcus Unger, and Reverend Mabley's sermon is titled, Help in Deep Sorrow, Worship. Now let's join Reverend Mabley and her guest, Will Flambert. Welcome to Eternally Yours Testimony Time. And today we have a really dynamic testimony. And if you know anyone that needs to be set free from anything, you phone them right now and say, tune in and listen to this testimony because it will stir your heart to believe God for anything and for anyone to be on fire for God. And I just uh, really know this fellow for decades and he's real, he's sincere. And I welcome today to the telecast, Wilf Lambert. Welcome. Thank you, Audrey. My pleasure to be here, to follow my dear wife. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, now, we want to hear a bit about your background, where you were born, and just who are you, Will? Well, I was born in uh, St. Laurent, Manitoba, and uh, I'm part Cree. And uh, we moved to Winnipeg when I was about five years old, I guess. And uh, my family, they, um, they, they were partiers. They were drinkers. And uh, I think Josie mentioned before also that my family loved me. And I think that's what made the, the difference in my whole life. You felt loved. Actually, I did. I knew I was loved. I didn't only feel, I knew I was loved by my parents. Mm. But they drank, they partied, and so I learned how to drink and party at a very, very young age. Uh, I started drinking. By the time I was married at uh, 17, I was just going on 18, um, I was an alcoholic already. Um, when we were married in the, uh, in the church, the, uh, they had to bring a, a chair for me to get married into because I, uh, I, was, I was pretty well hung over. So I was married sitting down. And uh, so that was a, a beginning. And uh, so I, I drank and I drank. And by the time I was married at 17, I was already uh, having blackouts. And uh, if, if anybody um, was or is an alcoholic, uh, you'd know what a blackout is. You just black out where you don't remember or know anything anymore. And uh, you wake up and many times I woke up in jail. Uh, I'd open my eyes and I was in jail already. Again. Mm. Oh, that would so, be awful. Well, it was, but I thought I was having a good time. I thought those were the good times. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't a very good time for my wife and my family. It was, it was very, very hard. But uh, anyway, I was, uh, you know, getting in trouble, and I, and, and I always thought it was, you know, the friends that I hung around with. Um, and really, it was me. You know, I didn't need the friends to lead me astray. So we moved to British Columbia um, from Winnipeg to try to get away from this whole mess that I'd gotten my, myself into. Uh, we moved here and uh, uh, very, very shortly I, I found a whole bunch of new drinking friends. And now they weren't my family anymore, they were Josie's family. They drank too. And so I had a whole, a whole bunch Josie's of new, new friends wife. to drink with. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so, um, you know, I ended up in jail here too, in, in British Columbia, and city jail, and Ocala, and all the rest of that. And I'm getting in trouble with drinking. Oh well, yeah, drink, drinking got me into trouble, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so anyway, one night, uh, to, to get to, you know, where I am today, uh, I was drinking with uh, three other guys. One was my brother. Another one was another guy named Pete, who was my best friend. I loved him like a brother, and he died from alcoholism. My brother died from alcoholism. Mm. Uh, this other friend that we were drinking with at the same time, I don't know where he is, but I know he lost his whole family. His, he had two kids and a wife. And uh, so I, last time I seen him, he was drunk, you know. And so as far as I know, I'm still the only one alive out of that group. And uh, so we were drinking uh, all day. On my way to another party, to my brother's place, we used to take turns having a party at my house or at Pete's place or my brother's place. It was my brother's turn. We were going to go and, and uh, terrorize his neighborhood, I guess you might say. And uh, so anyway, 
I, I suffer from claustrophobia also. I'm claustrophobic. And uh, when we were driving in the car, we had a trunk full of booze, and we were going to my brother's place to get a party, to, to, to have another party. And we drank for days when we drank. We didn't just drink a couple of drinks. We drank for days, and, you know, we'd pass out. And when you woke up, you drank again, you know, until you goodness. passed out again. And it was just on and on like that. So just before we got to, to my brother's place, I, I, I had this feeling of claustrophobia. And, like, I had to get out of this car. I had no idea what was happening but I was a scrapper too I fought with anybody and everybody and uh, so the guys that I was with they figured better let them out I told the guys let me out of this car you know let me so they let me out of the car reluctantly let me out of the car and as it was they left me they let me out by my driveway so I went uh, into the house and uh, Josie came downstairs and uh, after I knocked around and made a whole bunch of noise in the house and um, she led me to the Lord. I, um, and uh, again, uh, I had no idea why I was in my house. I, I had just gone. I'd been drinking all day, so I was, I was pretty drunk. And uh, have no idea. And, but I, I started crying at the table. And I asked my wife to, uh, you know, uh, I didn't ask her, but I said, I'm going to hell. I know that if I die today, I'm going to hell. And, uh, and, um, uh, that, that fear came over me right at that moment. And uh, she prayed with me, and I was led to the Lord then. But going back a little bit, we had all these people praying. I didn't have but my wife mm -hmm. had all these people praying mm -hmm. for me. And so this, I guess, was the result of that prayer, which I didn't know of at that time. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I, I got saved that night. Praise the living God. Amen. And then the next morning? Well, I uh, the next morning... Um, of course, Josie, I remember, she, uh, she had no faith to believe that I would even remember what happened the next morning. But I got up, I woke up, and uh, I asked her if she had told the children what, had, what we'd done, or what I had done. And I guess she was pretty surprised, but she called him in, and she said, Oh yeah, Daddy gave his heart to the Lord last night, and the kids kind of, yeah, yeah, okay, you know. Oh, but they, they saw it change. So what oh, happened yeah. to the drinking and the rowdiness and all? Tell us about that well, if you come it, to a close. It, it went away. That was the end of it. That Hallelujah. was the end of it. I never Hallelujah. took another drink after that. Just like that. And uh, I know my buddies that I was drinking with that night, I knew that they would come over mm -hmm. and, uh, t you know, t to see me. Hallelujah. And, uh, and sure enough, about a week later or so, uh, well, Josie, first of all, she had asked me, she said, uh, what are you going to do when your friends make fun of you? I said, I'll kill them. She said, oh, you can't do that anymore. She says, you're a Christian. I said, yeah, but I'm so new, I could start over again. <laughs> but anyway, that was just talk. Yeah. But so so the, you, it was a dynamic, just the same thing happened to me when I got saved. It was like, going back to the old way would be like a dog returning to vomit. Yeah, yeah. And coming to a close, would you please pray for those out there that are in bondage? Mm -hmm. God set you free, set me free too. If you want my testimony... Just uh, asked for the life of Audrey Mabley, and you've heard Welsh, and, and we're going to have him back again to share the ministry that opened up. But just say a prayer for those people out there that are in bondage, whether it's drugs, alcohol, anger, whatever. God has no respect for person's means. He loves you like he loved Wilf. He set him free. He set me free. He will set you free. Yeah. Jesus is the liberator. Yeah. Please pray for the viewers. Yeah. Oh, uh, Father, we, we just come to you right now. and. Mm -hmm. uh, Father, we pray right now for all the people that are watching and uh, all the people that know somebody that's in this uh, bondage, Lord. And uh, sometimes um, we, uh, we pray and we look at these people and we think that there is uh, no salvation for them. And they're just too far gone. Well, Lord, uh, we know that uh, alcohol and drugs are nothing for you. And you can, uh, you can work past and through that, Lord, just like you did for me. Father, I know it was easy for me uh, to, to give up alcohol because I never took another drink uh, after that night. But I know that it's not like that for everybody. And Father, I just pray that, uh, uh, that if you are in this bondage, that you will turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord and just pray and have people praying for you, mm -hmm. as many as you can. And I just pray right now. I just pray right now for everybody. 
Yes. Just touch them, Lord. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Set them free, Lord. If you need more prayer, phone in the counselor. Thank you, Will. We'll hear from you again. Thank You're you. Welcome. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is He. His eye is on that little sparrow, and I know He watches me. And I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Oh, his eye is on that little sparrow. And I know that he's watching me. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender words I hear and resting on his promise I lose all doubt and fear. Though by the path he leadeth, yet one step I would see. His eye is on that little sparrow, and I know that he's watching me. I know that he's watching me and I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free oh his eye is on that little sparrow and I know I know he's watching me and you too and you too and you too Thank you so much Josie Lambert for that anointed song Josie does have a wonderful CD that you can order through the telecast. And now I want to share from my heart in Christ a message I have entitled, In Deep Sorrow, Worship God. Now, help for deep sorrow is worship God. Do you understand that? <laughs> it's not easy to understand, but it's a sacrifice of praise. And I can so totally prove it by the word of God that is true and endureth forever, that never returns void. When David and Bathsheba had that son, and he cried unto God for help, and the son died, what did David do? He worshiped God. And I'm going to share with you in a few minutes my personal testimony of when I lost my son David and how worshiping God helped tremendously. Let's hear it from God's word. 2 Samuel 12, 16 to 20. David pleaded with God for the child. 
David fasted. He went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house rose and went to him to raise him up from the ground and to cheer him up. But he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day, so this is a whole week, he has been mourning. Then on the seventh day, it came to pass that the child died. And the servant of David was afraid, were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, that he may do some harm to himself. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord, and he worshipped. He worshipped. He'd lost his son that he loved. For a whole week he cried unto God and beseeched God and fasted. And he lasted that long. But what did he do when the child died? He worshipped God. Then he went into his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Now how I know this is true is because when I lost my own son in a tragic incident, he was in his 30s, I've had six, I have six, six kids all grown up, 13 grandchildren, and he was my um, third born. And um, I remembered, the Holy Spirit helped me remember what David did when he lost his son. So I went up into my bedroom lifted my hands towards the Lord and worshiped him. I sing a love song to our God. I sing a love song to Jesus Christ. I welcome the Holy Spirit. I gave the sacrifice of thanks because when you're worshiping God in deep sorrow and sadness and trouble, it's a sacrifice of praise. You don't really feel like praising him. But Psalm 22 says that we, God dwells in the praises of his children. And so in his presence, there's fullness of joy. In his presence, the enemy is made to perish. You see, when you lose someone or some deep loss, the enemy comes along and tries to put overmuch sorrow on you. And if you have overmuch sorrow, you can go down the depths of despair and even be tempted to take your life. That's what overmuch sorrow does. So to prevent that, give God the sacrifice of thanks and pray to him, Lord, help me not to have overmuch sorrow. So we worship God and then he sat down and he ate. And we need to follow that example. So that's what I did. Up in my bedroom, I worship God. I said, oh, thank you, Father. Praise you, Lord. And I was determined that my Lord God Almighty would be glorified somehow, some way to the loss of my son. That Satan wasn't going to get any benefits from that. And what happened was, with my evangelistic zeal, I said to my pastor at the time, I said, I'm going to give the gospel and I'm going to do the funeral. Because I knew I had the anointing to win people for Christ and I was determined God was going to be glorified. The pastor kindly said to me, okay, Audrey, but if you can't do it last minute, I'll, step in, I'll stand in the gap and I'll help you. Well, I did, by the anointing of God. The funeral home was packed. I gave the gospel how Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and he rose from the dead. And if they asked Christ in their life, they would be born of God, have the gift of life eternal as they confess Jesus Christ as Lord and live forever and ever with the Lord in eternity future. And you know what happened at that memorial for my son in his 30s, as I said? It was a chorus of people receiving Jesus. God was glorified in the loss of my dear precious son. And people would say to me, oh, it's going to hit you later. You're really going to find this hard. It's going to hit you like a thunderbolt. My dear fellow folks that are watching this telecast, it's been over 20 years. I didn't fall apart. I didn't take any alcohol. I didn't take any drugs. I just took strength from my God. So what I'm telling you is true. If you will worship God in the midst of your trying times, he will come down and he will strengthen you. The enemy perishes in the presence of God, and worship brings down his presence. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father, for that. Praise you, Jesus, for that. Let's hear another story from the Word of God. Job, in his troubles, he worshiped God. You can look at it in Job 1, 8 to 11, but I'm going to read a few verses. Verse 12, 20 to 22. 12 and 20 to 22. 
The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground, and he worshipped God. He worshipped God. Satan was troubling him. Satan was troubling him so much, he took his children. He took his cattle. He was one of the richest men in the East. He took everything that he owned, stripped him, so to speak, of all his fortune. Just his wife was left, who said to him, Something like, why don't you curse God and die? But no, Job did not do that. You see, Satan had to check with God how far he could trouble Job. You are never going to get from the enemy of our soul or people or anything, anyone that is greater than God is prepared to give you the strength to come through it, pure gold and have stronger faith and exercise your faith muscle. That has to be true because it's true he loves you and me like he loved Job. But what did Job do in the midst of it all? He worshipped God. I wonder what his wife thought of that, but he had the wisdom. He worshipped God. I encourage you, and I'm reminding myself, worship God in troubles. Worship God. Worship Him. Sing a love song to Him. Not just songs you might learn in church. Not just hymns you might know, but make up a love song. Like, praise you, Lord Jesus. I love you, Holy Father. Just put it to melody, how you feel about the Lord. For God instructs us even to laugh at our troubles. You can look at that in Job 5, 21, 22. Hallelujah. For restored joy, worship God. And you might think, and we sing the song, and I sang it for years, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. But you know what? You and I as Christians have Jesus Christ as Lord. You already have the garment of praise. It says so in Isaiah 61. Verse 2 and 3. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, Jesus came, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, and oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So for more help from God, worship him in the midst of your troubles. He says he's given you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. If God gives you something, or if anyone gives you something, unless you use that something that you were given, it won't profit you. You, beloved one who have Jesus Christ as Lord, you have the garment of praise. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord, please, I beseech you, phone in and the counselor will share how you can receive Jesus. This is your Lord and Savior. And you can have that garment of praise put upon you. And then you can exercise it, sing a love song to God, and his presence will come down like it did to help David, like it does to help me, like it did to help Job. God wants you to experience that, beloved ones. He really does. Psalm 1611. You will show me the path of life, for in your presence there's fullness of joy, at your right hand of pleasures forevermore. So God is enthroned in the praises of his children, Psalm 22, verse 3. So as his presence comes down, the enemy is made to perish, and you receive fullness of joy. <laughs> God wants you to have joy in the midst of your trying times. It's like a miracle, but I know it can happen. You start praising God, and the troubles will look kind of small, because what will happen is that here you are praising God, worshiping him, getting your thoughts, getting your mind on one that is greater than your trouble. For he's greater. He who created heaven and earth and the stars and the moon, he's greater than your troubles, folks. And God wants you to praise him, get your thoughts on him, off your troubles, and then his presence will come down. And after you've looked at him for a while in your praise, the troubles won't look so big anymore because God is greater. He really is, and he will help you. Amen. Eternally Yours Television is entirely supported by interested viewers and listeners like you. In appreciation of your gift of $20 or more, we are pleased to offer a gift. Please prayerfully consider your role in supporting Eternally Yours Television. 
precious ones who God loves so dearly. I know there are many times in our lives when we go through deep, trying things. It's just part of living, it appears. And when you hear, heard the story that I shared during this message, the true story of what happened to me, true story of what happened to Job, true story of what happened to David, the psalmist, you need to really grab hold of that, please, dear ones. There's this hope for you. Just be diligent, be desirous, even a sacrifice, worship God. He's worthy of your worship. He made heaven and earth, the stars and the moon, and he made you for his pleasure. He's worthy of, of our worship. And if you will do that, he will honor it. Oh, I know he will honor it. Like I know from experience, it's really true. Make up a love song to God. Shall I show you how? Just think of words of love towards our Creator and put them even to a melody. Words like this, I love you, Lord. I worship you. I praise your name. Most holy love. You are honored here. You are worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just sing a love song to him. Sing in the shower. Sing on the way to work. I was singing in Aquafit the other morning, and a fellow said to me, oh, I like your singing. And I said, I'm singing to the God I love. It was a, a witness of event. I could witness about Jesus. And you know, ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit too. The sign of a spirit-filled Christian is one who worships God. And may God put in your life and mine an attitude of gratitude. And I really want to pray that you will believe what you've heard today through the telecast. You will believe that if you will worship God, he will come down and in his presence you'll have fullness of joy. In his presence the enemy will be made to perish. Now I want to pray for you. Oh, Father in heaven, help us, your children, to praise you. You've given us a garment of praise. Help us exercise that garment of praise, even when it's a sacrifice. Help me help them to do so, God. Help the viewers to know it's really true. Help this message to sink in our hearts deep and strong. If we will worship you, you will help us, Lord God. You will come down. You will make the enemy to perish. And you will grant us fullness of joy. And you're worthy of our praise, Father. Help me. Help your people watching to truly worship you and sing a love song to you, Lord. Not just the hymns we know, but a love song. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. And thank you for watching. I hope you'll support the ministry. We could use your help. Amen.